let me say a word in defense of reason in dialogue with faith. Because faith is that proof. Faith unites us to that substance. But reason, in order to realize its full potential, needs the horizons revealed by and truths contained in the faith. And not just any faith, but the Catholic faith. I just wanted to mention, if I may, by way of commendation, two kinds of activities that I know have gone on in philosophy here. Uh, one is connected with uh, Professor Pat Lee, who I think is out there looking to see if he can turn up the volume on the microphone. But um, for his good work, really, uh, as McClear Chair uh, in Bioethics and Director of that institute, and, and has made some very, very good, valuable contributions uh, in the sphere of bioethics. Um, and I know that uh, he's recently completed or is completing uh, a book on marriage, which Cambridge University Press will publish and will be very interesting, a co-authored volume. But also the other um, ongoing uh, work that I wanted just to commend is the, um, uh, the promotion uh, of the thought of uh, sort of realist phenomenology, really, and particularly Dietrich von Hildebrand, and I see John Crosby joined us for dinner earlier. And to say that I think that is, is very important work as well, and I'm pleased to see the way that's been brought to fruition. Now, I'm not going to directly talk about bioethics or uh, realist phenomenology, but it will turn out that the themes that I want to present and explore uh, with you this evening are ones that have a bearing on bioethics and to which I think realist phenomenology can make a contribution. So there is, a, there is that bridge. So my title is um, Three Perspectives on uh, Human Life. And in fact, I'm going to talk about three sets of three perspectives. So in fact, we're going to have nine perspectives in a way by the time I've finished. And if, I, if there's time, I may even push that up to 12. A uh, fourth set of perspectives. But some of these perspectives merge or at least overlap. Um, and uh, I will uh, I'll indicate uh, as and when that prospect is before us. So let me start, first of all, just by saying what, the, uh, what these perspectives that I want to explore are, and then I'll come back and, and go through them um, uh, with a degree of care. The first set of perspectives, and really these are the main perspectives with which I'm concerned, I'm going to call the perspective from above, the perspective from below, and the perspective from within. So that's really the dominant set that I'm going to be concerned with, the perspective from above, the perspective from below, and the perspective from within. And I'll explain what I mean by that uh, shortly. The next um, sort of set of perspectives will be the perspective from morality, um, the perspective from selfhood, and the perspective from science. A third set will be the perspective of the agent, the perspective on the action, and the perspective on the outcome. And then... Uh, finally, the perspective from prudence, the perspective from autonomy, and the perspective from concern. Now, I know that's a lot to take in, but basically the dominant set to uh, have in mind is what I'm calling the perspective from above, the perspective from below, and the perspective from within. Now, I think the easiest way to illustrate uh, what I have in mind um, is by imagining ourselves back into, uh, say, the 13th century. And thinking about the human condition and human life, and these are all, by the way, perspectives on human life, uh, thinking about what these three perspectives might represent, or another way of putting that is where these are perspectives from uh, to uh, an educated 13th century um, thinker, uh, not necessarily a you know, systematic thinker, but an educated, thoughtful person, um, what these are perspectives on and what they reveal uh, about uh, human life from those positions. So the perspective from above, so far as a Western European in the 13th century is concerned, is a perspective uh, from the viewpoint of God. Now, not a perspective that that person thinks that they themselves can adopt, but they, as it were, live their lives conscious uh, of the thought that there is a viewpoint on their lives, the viewpoint taken by God. And that's the perspective from above. Um, in the pre-Christian pagan world, there was a sort of counterpart of that, not the perspective 
of the gods in the sense of Greek or Roman gods, but really the perspective of the cosmos. So Stoic philosophers, for example, would be very interested in the perspective from above, as I shall call it, but that would be the perspective on humanity, on human life, human condition, human foibles, and so on, uh, from the point of view of the cosmos. And some of the Stoics, not all, but some of the late Stoics thought the cosmos was a kind of minded perspective, and so it, it had a view, as it were. Uh, but by the time we get to our people, uh, Western Europeans of the high Middle Ages, the perspective from above is the perspective, um, the divine perspective. And the divine perspective on human life and the human condition in that period is essentially the perspective of a provident sovereign. Um, now, that notion of sovereignty, kingship if you like, and the providentialism that in this case goes with it, it doesn't always go with kingship, but in this case went with it, um, is something that was fashioned over the centuries out of really the Abrahamic covenant, uh, the Jewish sense of the sovereignty of God, sovereignty of Yahweh, and the relationship, the Abrahamic covenant. Uh, you know, I shall be your Lord and you will be my people. Um, now the Jews bequeathed to Christianity that sense of God as a sovereign Lord who would provide for his people. But whereas for the Jews, the people were the people of Israel, um, for Christianity, they were the people of Christ, and that obviously um, transcended the distinction between Jew and Gentile and so on. But this, so this is really a, a kind of developed out of Judaism and indeed out of Roman law as well. But anyway, the idea of, that there's a view from above which is the divine view upon the human condition, and it's the view of a providential sovereign and seen from that point of view, or imagined from that point of view, because obviously human beings can't adopt that, strictly adopt that point of view, how human beings emerge are as subjects. They're subjects of a sovereign. And there would be petitionaries and so on, but the divine court stands above them. Um, and God is a judge, and God may find in their favor, he may show mercy in one thing or another, and so on. But the conception of the human condition from the perspective from above is uh, a perspective on subjects who are dependent entirely on the benign um, uh, providence of their sovereign. The perspective from below for this educated person that I'm imagining is provided by the natural philosophy of the times. Now the, by natural philosophy here I really mean the natural science of the times. And I've chosen my period as one in which in the West there was a rediscovery, really, of Aristotelian natural science. So this perspective is, broadly speaking, Aristotelian about the natural order. And it believes in a hierarchy of living forms. Um, it believes, as Aristotle did and as Aquinas did and we don't, in fixed species. Um, there was no evolution of species exactly in this, but that issue is in a sense, not that. Well, it, will, it will become important, perhaps, but it's not that important at this point. So they believe in a, a, a hierarchy of species, and these various species are organized in this hierarchy according to the scheme provided by Aristotle in the De Anima. So we have at the lower level um, purely vegetative beings, plants, um, and then we have sentient beings, which, like plants, exchange matter with their environment and reproduce, but also move themselves and um, have sense kind of sense perception. And then above that we have rational animals. And these rational animals, as I say, like the vegetation, they reproduce, they take in matter from their environment, like the animals they move around. But unlike the animals, they have the capacity of deliberation, choice, intellection, and so on. So the view from below, as provided by Aristotelian natural science, gives my 13th century educated reflective person a view of himself or herself as a, a rational animal, as um, embedded in nature, but as it were, uh, as representing the peak of the natural order. And they can see themselves as sort of built up out of nature, but as it were, transcending nature, because they are perfected as an image of God. 
Um, now, the first the thing to note is that these two perspectives, the perspective from above and the perspective from below, are, are easily harmonizable. Uh, this, this view of human beings as subjects of a providential sovereign and this view of human beings as rational animals, transcending mere matter but rooted in it and so on, these are fairly easily reconcilable. We're creaturely subjects. Um, Another view from within is, if you like, the sort of existential lived experience of what it is to be a human being. And anybody who reflects on what it is to be a human being, as we know from the writings of that period and pretty much every period, has a sense of the human, is impressed by two things, I think. One is, on the one hand, the human capacity for intelligent thought and deliberated action, action aimed at the good, and also um, is impressed by the fact of human stupidity and recurrent fallibility and failure uh, and wrongdoing and so on. Um, so the view from within is a view of human beings as in some respects genuinely special as the Aristotelian natural philosophy told them they were and as the Imago Dei creaturely subject story told them they were but also as flawed and fallible and uh, broken in various ways and wounded and so on and um, that could be explained in part from below be by the imperfection of the matter out of which we're made and could be ex explained from above by the breach in the Abrahamic covenant and the breach in the contract and one thing and another, and sin and you know, the familiar lapsarian story and the original lapsation and then the subsequent breaking of the Abrahamic covenant. And so they could see themselves as both as were possessed of reason and of moral consciousness but also burdened by sin and fallibility and brokenness. So the point is that the perspectives from above, from below and from within to the educated 13th century figure are easily reconcilable and indeed one seems to confirm the other. They are sort of mutually supportive. Now um, the first thing to be said is that's not our situation for the most part. We inhabit a deeply confused, intellectually confused culture and world. I'm not now talking about the United States as against Britain or Britain as against France or whatever else it may be. What I mean is the intellectual view of um, educated people in the Western world and those other parts of the world influenced by the West is profoundly fragmented and confused. Um, we don't know whether there is a view from above um, as I said, the Stoics could think that that was the view from the cosmos. Um, Jews and Christians could think that was the view from the point of view of God. And of course, Muslims could also. Um, but many people, in, uh, many educated people in Western culture uh, simply don't know if there is a view from above. Um, because they don't think the cosmos is minded in that sort of way. And uh, increasingly, don't, they don't think there is a God. And even those who think there is a God are somewhat uncomfortable with the picture of God as a sovereign. Um, it was very natural for the Jews and for the Christians to form a conception of God as a divine sovereign uh, modeled on the basis of tribal and other forms of social leadership in which you had something like a sovereign. I mean, kingship, for those of you I don't know, um, well, the social anthropology is a field of study here, but um, kingship is a, is a class, kingship and kinship are classic terms of anthropological analysis. And um, most social anthropologists will, will tell you that in communities you will find both kinship and kingship. So the notion of kingship comes very naturally to the human mind out of tribal leadership. Um, and uh, so it was very uh, a natural thing for people to model their understanding of God on the basis of the idea of a, a, a providential tribal leader or king and so on. Now, uh, we tend not to think of our relations with one another in that way. The rise of democracy, obviously. Um, a kind of broader egalitarianism, not an economic egalitarianism, but the doctrine of equal worth um, I think leaves people slightly at ill with the idea that God, that God is a sovereign, that that's the right way to think about it. Or to think of the heavenly court seems a sort of slightly anachronistic way of thinking. Now this may be wrong, but I'm just pointing out the difficulties that modern educated people have in trying to form a view of the human condition from above. 
as I say, either they think there is no above from which to view it, there's nobody there, as it were, neither the cosmos nor God. And if God is there, God isn't a sovereign. Whatever God's relationship is to humanity, it's not that of a king and subjects. So that's problematic. Um, the view from below has become increasingly problematic because that picture of a well-ordered um, natural, uh, natural world in which things are structured by these fixed natures and so on, um, first of all, uh, you know, suffered a tremendous blow um, with uh, the origin of species. But um, the particular position of humanity in all of this <laughs> suffered a further blow with the um, descent of man, uh, the idea of common ancestry, uh, the idea that human beings indeed are related to other parts of nature, but not in the way that Aristotle thought, but because they have, as it were, grown out of the same um, animal base, the, the, the common uh, ancestry of humankind from within the animal kingdom more generally. And of course, that, um, the third sort of advance of that picture and the undermining of a traditional picture came with the development uh, in the 20th century of genetics. Um, because um, genetics seems to subvert uh, kind of phenotypical characterizations of species. So Aristotelian taxonomy is of animal kinds in terms of basically their appearance and what they do, their function. Um, you know, so you can divide flying things from those things that live on the ground and those things that live in the sea and so on. Well, uh, the idea of, of a common ancestry, first of all, sort of unsettles that idea that there are things that belong naturally in one place rather than another. But genetics further uh, subverts that because genotypical classifications tend not to um, coincide with phenotypical classifications. So, you know, when you look at genotype taxonomies, they give you a very different picture uh, of the natural world to the classical taxonomies, the phenotypical taxonomies. So the picture from below <laughs> that begins to emerge is a very confused one. Human beings just don't seem special anymore. Um, certainly, if they are special, that specialness doesn't look as if it can be captured by natural science. So that natural science seems to undermine the claims to distinctiveness and specialness of human beings. And then the view from within for the contemporary educated person, not all educated persons, but many, um, particularly the sort of people who write editorials for the New York Times or the Washington Post or the London Times and so on. Uh, the view from within is of, at best, pluralism and more likely relativism. The idea that there just isn't, if you ask the question, you know, what is the nature of the human condition as experienced from within, the medievals could give a fairly clear answer, the one that I described earlier on. But for um, modern man, contemporary man, humanity, the view from within looks pretty crazy and messed up and uncertain and highly relevant. I mean, we find ourselves pulled by all sorts of different kinds of appetites and values. Freudianism, um, psychoanalysis, Marxism, various other kind of alternative narratives uh, through to Foucault and later figures all put in question the idea that things are as they seem to us in our experience. You know, we, it looks as if, as it were, the nature of my relationship with somebody else is, say, one of love, and then the Freudian tells me it really isn't that, or the Marxist tells me that my relationship with um, other members of my society isn't what I thought it was, it's really something else, or the Nietzschean tells me, and so on and such like. And contemporary humanity, reflective, educated people, uh, are the inheritors of Nietzsche and Freud and Marx. Duheim and so on. So there's there this kind of suspicion uh, about mistrusting what experience suggests and also the awareness that experience suggests very different things to different people. And that's where relativism comes in. I mean that people's experiences are culturally shaped and uh, different cultures, different sets of experiences. And then also the growth of things like gender theory, queer theory and so on. All of these subvert the idea that there is such a thing as a common human experience to which we have access reflectively and so on. So the first thing then to say is that in the medieval period it looked like one could adopt these three perspectives or imaginatively adopt them and find things to say about the human condition as imagined from each of those perspectives 
And the things that were said were mutually uh, confirming and uh, produced a picture of uh, a kind of Christian humanism. Whereas today, people are not sure that these perspectives are all available, and to the extent that they are, they seem to be in conflict with one another to some degree. So there's a great deal of confusion. And I think that a, a lot of confusion that is around in the culture is related, both at the level of individuals and social groups, <coughs> is related to this inability to form a coherent picture of the human condition from these different diverse perspectives. Okay, so let me now shift to a different a trio of um, concerns or perspectives. Um, this is related, um, but not exactly the same. Um, this set really is, um, picks up on the idea that we recognize in ourselves and certainly we're told that we exhibit a kind of material animality. So all that genetic um, theorizing and um, other accounts of human speciation and things of that sort emphasize the material foundations uh, of human nature, um, the genetic foundations, and then even below that, uh, molecular biology and so on. So they, to the extent they find a picture for animality, it's a very materially founded picture. Um, th that's one way of thinking about what it is to be human, which is really just to be a very complicated uh, collection of matter um, that's developed in a certain kind of way. But there's a different perspective on what it is to be human, which is uh, the perspective of judgment. What I mean is, we're told that we, are, we, we differ from the rest of the universe only in the organization of the matter that comprises us. But on the other hand, we have a very strong sense that other bits of the universe um, are not responsible for their behavior in the way that we may be. So one aspect of our take on ourselves, which troubles us deeply, is that we seem to be answerable to certain, um, or open to certain kinds of criticism as not having done the right thing. In other words, we have a sense of ourselves as subjects of judgment, people who are there, or animals that are there, and have to make judgments about what they do. They can't just, as it were, let the forces move them along. They have to make decisions. So this is, as it were, the sense or the perspective on animal being that is aware of the fact of the necessity of making judgments. And wonders quite how that can be because other animals don't seem to be burdened in that way. And related to that is the sense of ourselves as subjects of consciousness that matter as we see it. I mean, on one hand, we're told that we're merely aggregations of matter. In many ways, that seems plausible. On the other hand, nobody thinks that rocks or stones or trees are conscious. So there is something very peculiar about this particular aggregation of matter that it's conscious. So there's these three moments, as it were, in our sense of ourselves, our material animality, uh, our sense of ourselves as burdened by requirements of judgment, and also as being conscious. Um, <coughs> third set of perspectives. The way to get to this set of perspectives is to um, think about action. Now, um, <coughs> following on from what I said a moment ago, I said that we think of ourselves as material objects, we think of ourselves as conscious beings, but we also think of ourselves as subject to judgment, as having to both make judgments ourselves and being judgeable uh, on account of our conduct. Now, just taking that last step, here's the question to ask, what is it that gets judged when judgments are made? When people say that was right or wrong, that was good or bad, what is it that they're judging right or wrong or good or bad? Well, uh, the obvious answer to that would seem to be action. It's actions that are judged to be right or wrong, good or bad, so far as human beings are concerned. Um, well, then let's ask ourselves the question, what is action in this respect? What is it that's the object of these kinds of judgments? Now, when we ask that question, something very quickly emerges, which is that we typically use the word action in a broad sense and in a narrow sense. So the broad sense of action, which is a subject of judgment, the kind of thing that's judged to be right or wrong, good or bad, 
The broad sense of action begins in the agent with certain kinds of motivations, carries through into what they do, and then issues in a certain outcome or result. So action in the broad sense has these three elements, the agent, the thing done, and the outcome or the result of the thing done. But putting it that way, we immediately see there's a narrower sense of action, which is action in the sense of the thing done. Right? So if we talk about action, we might be concerned comprehensively with the agent, the thing done, and the outcome of the thing done, or we might be concerned rather narrowly uh, with the thing done. That's a sense of action in the narrow sense. What did he do? Right? Where, where, what his motives were and what the result of that is could just be bracketed out. Yeah, but what did he actually do? You were there, you saw it, what did he do? That sense of action. Now, here's a good way, I think, of organizing ethical theories or ethical thinking. Um, if we ask a question about explanatory priority, then it's pretty clear that explanatory priority attaches to agencies, and I'll explain what I've just said. If somebody says, where did this come from? I mean, if we, you know, if I look at this lectern or this microphone or the state of affairs in which you're gathered here and I'm standing here, how did that come about? Or a painting or building, whatever it may be, how did that come about? Well, the answer is going to be because certain things were done. You know, wood was brought together, it was composed in various ways and so on. So we explain a state of affairs as being an outcome of things done. And then somebody says, well, how, how did it come about that those things were done? Then the answer is going to take us back to agents and their motivations, their purposes, their plans, and so on. So in terms of explanatory questions, agency precedes action and action precedes outcome. We explain outcomes as being consequential upon things done, and we explain things done uh, consequential upon the motivations that agents have, and so on. But I want to ask a different question. Not a question about explanatory priority, but a question about evaluative priority. If you're evaluating action in the broad sense, what, what, where does that evaluation come from in terms of those three elements I mentioned, the agent, the thing done, and the outcome? Now, you can take the view, and some philosophers have done, that evaluative priority attaches to the outcome. That's to say, you trace value to the outcome. And so we characterize outcomes as being good or bad in whatever way. And then we say that an action is right or wrong or good or bad in as much as it brought about that outcome. And an agent is good or bad in as much as they engaged in that action with the purpose or intent of bringing about that outcome. And put in that way, what emerges from this is, broadly speaking, consequentialism, or more specifically, perhaps, utilitarianism. So utilitarianism is a theory that attaches a value to priority to outcomes. Now, supposing you say, well, let's think about this differently. What happens if we attach a value to priority to sort of thing done? Say, that's what really matters. Then we'll want to say that outcomes are good only insofar as they result from the right thing having been done. And agents will be good only insofar as they do the right thing. But it's doing the right thing that has a value to a priority. Well, on the basis of that, we'll get a different set of ethical theories, those that are generally termed deontological. Deontological ethical theories focus on certain right kinds of action, and they explain the goodness of agents and the goodness of outcomes uh, in those terms. That's why, from the point of view of somebody who takes this view, if you do the right thing, but it has disastrous consequences, you're not in trouble, or at least you're not in trouble if you took a you know, suitable account of that prospect in your deliberations. Because what matters is the right thing. And if you've done the right thing, it does have the right result, because the right result is the result of having done the right thing. The other stuff is, is less important. Well, that suggests a third possibility, which is that evaluative priority attaches not to the outcome, nor to the thing done, but to the agent. So now we're going to say, we explain the rightness of conduct uh, in terms of the right sort of motivations or character and so on. And then a right action is an action that is expressive of, flows from a good kind of character, and um, a good outcome is one that is the result of an action done out of good character. Now, um, <coughs> that third might go under the t heading of virtue ethics, though 
if we've got a chance for some questions, people could take that up. I, I myself am sceptical about virtue ethics for a reason which I'm happy to explain. But basically, I, in fact, I'm sceptical about all three of those possibilities. <laughs> um, my own view is that uh, if you try and answer the question about the rightness or wrongness of action in the broad sense, by giving a value to priority to one or other of those um, elements, uh, you're going to end up with a wrong view. Uh, I actually think there's no evaluative priority. Uh, that's to say we can't get a, 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 the right account of doing the right thing, if you like, or right conduct, other than integrating these three elements, the element of agency, the element of conduct, and the element of outcome. Now, having said that, let me, while I'm piling up all these trios, uh, let me move to the fourth set of three perspectives. So that, that one I've just gone gives you the perspective on conduct from outcome, the perspective from thing done, the perspective from agency. Now I want to move on to my third set of um, perspectives. And this does bring me in a way to bioethics, but not only to bioethics. Um, what I want to suggest is that um, ethical deliberation, so let me take a step back to explain this. What I was just talking about a moment ago in terms of evaluative priority and ethical theories, that is ethical theory. That is trying to construct general philosophical accounts of what makes it, what the right account to give is of right and wrong in action overall. That's ethical theory. But quite apart from ethical theory, which is exclusively the business of philosophers, though moral theologians obviously engage in something similar, there is something a more basic and perhaps more important, which is ethical thinking. I'm not talking about the thing that only philosophers do, I'm talking about the thing that anybody has to do who's alert to the fact, this perspective on the human condition that sees what we do as being subject to judgment. Is this right, is this wrong, and so on. Not necessarily external judgment, maybe our own judgment, the judgment of conscience or whatever. So what I'm concerned with now is not ethical theory, but ethical thinking, deliberating about what to do. Now, um, the view that I want to recommend is that ethical deliberation, thinking about what to do, is conducted, or at any rate ought to be conducted, within a three-dimensional space. So a three-dimensional space, classically, Cartesian coordinates and so on, is obviously formed by three axes. Okay, you've got up got the vertical, the horizontal, and the one that goes into the depth. Um, now, uh, I want to suggest that ethical deliberation occurs or should occur within a three-dimensional space. Um, and, but, I, but I'm using his space here metaphorically, so let me explain what the three dimensions are that construct this space. Um, if you look at debates about, say, uh, social ethical thinking, where societies are trying to arrive at policies on various matters, or groups of professionals are, and individuals in as much as they're members of social groups or members of professions. One of the dominant models for decision-making, deliberation and decision-making, uh, was broadly speaking a welfarist utilitarian one. That if you are having to arrive at decisions that will impact upon people's lives, say these are spending decisions, resource allocation decisions and so on, what you ought to be attended to was the impact that this would have upon the well-being or welfare of those concerned. And that model uh, is convenient in some ways because um, it gives you a very simple uh, picture which is um, probability times expected utility. Right? If you're trying to decide between different options, you just assign values to those different possible outcomes in terms of the impact that they will have positively or negatively on the well-being or welfare of those concerned. That's your utility ranking. And then you try and assign probabilities to the likelihood of those outcomes occurring if you adopt a given policy and so on. There are also things you have to throw in there like opportunity costs, but that's another matter. But at any rate, probabilities times utilities times opportunity costs is just going to give you a value for each outcome. And it's no surprise really in a way that um, Rational choice theory and welfare economics, which is what I've just described in very brief terms, was very influential on public policy making because it's, it's a very clear way of proceeding. What are we to do? You know, 
uh, say drug allocation, you know, should we invest money in the development of new kinds of drugs or should we invest money uh, in certain therapies which are kind of low-tech therapies but we can provide them to many more people? Well, you just do that calculation. You think about the question of the impact it would have, the opportunity cost, the probability of the outcome, and that will resolve matters for you. Now, the obvious problem about this, as those of you who've been through any ethics class will know, is that utilitarianism has some unattractive uh, implications. One is it doesn't respect the distinctness of persons. Uh, what that calculation does is it just puts everybody into the pool and then just makes deliberate, it comes to a decision on the basis of aggregate welfare or well-being or utility. Another one, of course, is, which is related to this, is that it instrumentalizes people. Um, it allows us to treat some people in ways that are enormously harmful to them as long as the net benefit to the many is greater than that. And people have thought that that was a kind of violation. So the conclusion I draw from this is not that consideration of welfare, well-being, described in the way that I've just described it, is irrelevant, but that it constitutes at most one axis. And the problem with that kind of th ethical thinking, it was just one-dimensional ethical thinking. So we need to add more. All right, so what's the second dimension? <coughs> well, um, and here I'm just sort of tracking history. I suppose really in the 1970s, but Pat would know better than I exactly when this came on the scene, but people started to say, look, there's something that this perspective is failing to attend to, which is the autonomy of those uh, affected. That you're not, as it were, respecting um, the distinctness, I put it in terms of the distinctness of persons, but moreover, you're not respecting their rights to self-governance and to control their own lives and things of that sort. So what comes onto the scene now is, uh, for example, in the case of uh, uh, medical ethics, enormous interest in things like consent, you know, that you shouldn't engage in any experimentation without full info information and consent of the parties involved and so on. Even if it would produce greater welfare, you can't do it unless you've secured their consent. That's one way of expressing a respect for autonomy uh, or self-governance or the distinctness of persons. So that's good, but that gives us a second dimension. So now we have to, we've got a two-dimensional space. But it's not enough um, because as the great English philosopher actually half Scots philosopher, John Stuart Mill said, and I do want to emphasize, because I'm sure you've been told that John Stuart Mill, as a utilitarian, he went to boo at that point, but John Stuart Mill was a great philosopher, and a very considerable man. In uh, utilitarianism, Mill says, it matters not only what men do, but what manner of men they are that do it. It matters not only what men do, but what manner of men they are that do it. Mill, as his critics hardly ever mention, was very concerned with virtue. He thought it was exceedingly important that people should be formed to be virtuous characters. That's what he meant by, it matters not only what you do, but what manner of person you are that does it. And what Mill was concerned with, I mean, Mill is a problematic philosopher for other reasons, but what I think he was alert to here is that we don't just want people to do the right thing in the sense of the welfare-promoting thing or the... Um, autonomy respecting thing, we want people to do things for the right reasons. So we don't simply want these kind of bloodless bureaucrats distributing welfare, even in account with people's you know, consensual agreement, we want people to care about those that they're dealing with. So again, this connects with a tradition, a more recent tradition in bioethical thinking, the so-called ethics of care. But the problem is that these different, uh, and by the way, that's sometimes been connected with feminist ethics, and there's a lot could be said about that. But um, these ways of thinking are each interesting, but they've, put in, been put as, they've been presented, as it were, as if the ethics of autonomy should supplant uh, the ethics of welfare, and the ethics of um, care should somehow supplant the ethics of, of um, autonomy. Just like some people say, oh, you know, deontology should supplant utilitarianism or virtue ethics should supplant them both. I think that's a mistake. As I said earlier on, I think there can't be such a thing as a pure virtue ethics. I don't think there can be a pure deontological ethic. I don't think there can be a pure outcome ethic. And I also think at the level of first level moral thinking, you can't do ethics simply with regard to welfare or with regard to autonomy 
or respect or with regard to um, care, that you've got to work these together. We've got to try to work these together. Okay, so where have we got to? Well, what we've got, <laughs> we've got to is this. My imagined friend of the High Middle Ages had his problems, her problems, but they weren't conceptual or intellectual problems. These three viewpoints were available to them and they could be integrated. We, uh, don't mean the people in this room necessarily, but more broadly, we are in the situation in which we don't know whether or not there are three perspectives. We're not sure what things look like from those perspectives, if they exist, and we certainly don't know how to integrate them. And I think that these other trios or trilogies that I've been talking about are manifestations to some degree of the same phenomenon, of a kind of disintegration. That we recognize vaguely that something about welfare really matters, we recognize vaguely that something about autonomy matters, we recognize that care matters, we just don't know how they all matter together. So what are we going to do about it? Um, well, at this point I could just say I don't know, that's the end of the lecture, I just wanted to pose the problem. But let me, I think that might be a little <laughs> troublesome. Uh, so let me just try and say a little bit about what I think we need to do. Well, in brief, what I think we need to do is to develop an account of what it is uh, to be human. Now, the first thing to say is that a plurality of perspectives isn't in and of itself necessarily problematic. You know, somebody might think the problem that I've been posing is that there's different ways of looking at something and that that in itself is the problem. That's not the problem. The very metaphor of perspectives suggests that these are perspectives on one and the same thing. Right? So it looks as if even to describe a plurality of perspectives presupposes a unity of object seen. So a plurality of viewpoints doesn't in itself um, pose the problem. Indeed, as I say, on the contrary, these viewpoints are viewpoints on one thing and what we know about perspectives or viewpoints is that that's what you get. If you walk around something, it looks different from, uh, from these different perspectives. But there's no incompatibility there. On the contrary, we can predict how to look from one point of view given the centrality of the thing and so on. So in fact, perspectives are unified by the object upon which they are perspectives. So that isn't the problem. And furthermore, it isn't necessarily even the problem that we've got different ways of thinking. Um, Really, I mean, one of the uh, fruits of um, analytical philosophy in the 20th century was really to see how far could be taken a central insight of um, philosophy of language of the late 19th and early 20th centuries, the distinction drawn by Frege between sense and reference. And what that really is, I mean, Frege's way of putting this, which is even more helpful, is that objects are never just given to us. This, by the way, relates to realist phenomenology. Uh, objects are never just given to us. They're given to us via modes of presentation. That is where our encounter with a thing is always an encounter with it in a certain way, through a certain body of information, through how it looks from a given viewpoint, or whatever it may be. And um, the message of this is that things can look different uh, because they're given via different modes of presentation or they can sound different because they're given via different sets of descriptions, but these can be compatible. It can be one and the same thing that is given in one way and is given in another way. So perspectives aren't problematic as such in securing unity or coherence, and even differences of what's seen from different perspectives, different in character as it were, needn't in itself be problematic because that difference in character might be attributable to the distinct modes of presentation. I mean, just think of it this way. I mean, different kinds of animals might have different optic setups so that what looks red to one looks green to another. You might think, oh, there's a big problem, right? But it might be the same reality that is given under different modes of presentation. So it's not that. It's neither perspectives nor modes of presentation. It's the content of these. So what I think the task is to try to work out an account of the object of these perspectives, the perspective from above, from below, from within, from the point of view of prudence, from the point of view of morality, from the point of view of welfare, from the point of view of autonomy, from the point of view of care, and so on and such like. Try and work out a picture of what it is that is um, the common object, if there is a common object. I mean, that's part of the challenge. Is there a common object here? Now, uh, here I'm going to be brief. 
But I just want to well, sketch lightly what I think is the way to proceed in this. Um, it is to form uh, a conception of what it is to be a human being, to form an understanding of what it is to be a human being, or to, as it were, articulate, express, and explore an understanding of what it is to be a human being. Now, going right back to my original three perspectives, I think any such um, conception it should have space for the view from above, the, space, the view from below, and the, space, and the view from within. But I want to just, at this point, focus very briefly on the view from within. Because I think that the, I mean, one way of labeling what I've just proposed is a call for something like a naturalistic or ethical naturalistic view of the human being, and that might resonate in some ears with ideas of natural law and human nature as it's conceived of, say, by the scholastics or something of that sort. Well, I do think that we need an account of human nature, what it is to be human, and I don't think that we have an account of what it is to be human. I'm not sure that even as great a thinker as Aquinas had a fully adequate account of what it is to be human, but I know we don't have one. If he did have it, we've lost sight of it because of this fragmentation that I've described. But here's what I want to suggest. Um, some people think that appeals to human nature are problematic for a couple of reasons. Oh, I mean, maybe many reasons, but I'm just going to mention two. One goes right back to something I said at the very outset, which is that Aristotle and Aquinas and others who classically talked about human nature believed in fixed species, fixed species. Nobody should now believe in fixed species. I mean, you know, whatever one wants to say about evolutionary theory, we know that speciation has occurred um, by iteration over very long periods of time and that there are continuities among species. Now, there may be something special about human beings. In fact, I think there is something special about human beings. But to say how it comes about that there's something special about human beings, I think, calls for a theological answer. But um, what we know scientifically about the history of speciation tells us that the boundaries of human nature, at least naturalistically, are not fixed. Um, more could be said about that. I mean, both historically they're not fixed, and they may not even be fixed synchronically. There may be populations concerning which the question, are these human beings, is a real question from a genetic scientific point of view. I don't mean that makes them lesser. I'm just saying that's the nature of speciation and, and breeding populations and so on. So there's a, somebody might say, well, you can't invoke human nature because there is no such thing as human nature. Evolution tells us that. Well, that's just a mistake. Right? Um, a belief in human nature is the idea of a belief in there being some kind of underlying organizing principle. Whether that principle is dynamic, product of iterations of generations and centuries and millennia and so on, or whether it's fixed, is just a different question. Right? At the level at which we're proceeding, um, this is you know, a momentary eye blink, the history of the last you know, 3,000 years and so on. Evolutionary time is much, much more slower than that. So even if it is the case that there are evolutionary changes, that the history of human beings takes us to things that were non-human, we've got the period that we're looking at, and are going to be looking at for a long period, is one in which there's relative fixity. So I think evolution in itself doesn't undermine the idea of human nature or even enduring human nature. Another concern, however, that people have is that this biologizes human beings, that if we hand this over to science, aren't we just going to get back the story about genetics and all of that stuff that I described earlier on as being partly problematic? And I think the answer to that is, yes, if we just over hand it over to science, we will have that problem. <coughs> but then somebody might say, well, how could, where could it be, how could this inquiry be conducted if it were not a scientific inquiry? And now the answer, it seems to me, is as the viewpoint from within. That really the best and indeed the only way of finding out what human beings are is by seeing the way that human nature reveals itself to us in our actions, in those very things that I've been concerned about, consciousness, experience, agency, and so on. And I want to suggest that an understanding of what it is to be human is not essentially an empirical inquiry. It's not a question of 
in the way in which we might study uh, certain kinds of spiders or something of that sort, which would be done from an external point of view, and we could um, taxonomize them either phenotypically or genotypically and so on. The um, classification of human beings as human beings is neither phenotypical nor genotypical. It is, as it were, agential and um, uh, consciential. I mean, it's from the point, it's, we classify ourselves as we are given to ourselves in our thoughts and in our actions. Um, and what is given to us is a nature, the understanding of which is formed not scientifically, um, nor is it an innate idea, it's an idea, it's a concept that's fashioned in action. In other words, we understand what we are by what we do, um, not by observing ourselves externally, uh, though obviously that information may be interesting, um, nor uh, by viewing ourselves even from the point of view of God, but simply and directly from the, because that's not a point of view we can adopt, but simply and directly uh, from the perspective of agency. And human understanding is fashioned through activity. I mean, understanding not only of the world, but of what it is to be a human being. What it is to be a human being is revealed as human agency manifests itself in our own consciousness and in our own uh, action. Now, I think that one aspect to add to that is that um, human nature is historically dynamic. Um, that's to say, although I'm not talking about evolutionary change, I'm not talking about cultural development and so on, that some of the activity that we have to look at to discover what we are is cultural and social activity. Um, and that, I think, is, uh, is exceedingly important. Um, but this understanding is intrinsically normative. It's an understanding of our actions and of our thoughts as being candidates for judgment. That's why I mentioned that earlier on. That what it is to be a human agent is to be sensitive to the fact that one's thinking is answerable to standards of correct thinking, one's action is answerable to standards of correct action. And that reveals to us, and it's on that basis, that we fashion an understanding of what it is to be human. You don't discover what it is to be a human being by, if I can put it this way, studying human beings. I mean, that's part of the picture, but that's secondary to uh, learning what it is to be a human being by being one, that this uh, concept of humanity is revealed to us in our action and is to some extent up for negotiation or to up for discussion at any rate. And that's why I think these um, struggles over the question of, say, welfare, the promotion of welfare, the um, regard for respect, the regard for care, are really very important and perhaps more important than people have recognized because I think they're not just debates about what's right, they're debates about what we are. They're ways of finding out what we are. That the human is revealed to itself through the thoughts and actions that it finds itself to be the subject of and what we find is that we are pulled by different kinds of considerations. Now, uh, to complete the picture, and I'll just stop there, obviously much more needs to be said about this, I think when you start to tease out these different strands that we find that are revealed to us in action, that um, something of what is revealed takes us back to the three-part picture with which I began, the picture from above, the picture from below, the picture within, because there are things that are revealed to us about our own agency that make absolutely evident that we're animals. I don't mean barbarous animals, I mean we're, we're, not, we're not angels, we're not Cartesian souls or Augustinian souls and bodies, we are animals. Um, but a second thing I think it reveals to us is that we're animals under a kind of governance not of our own making, and I think that's relevant to the sense that the medievals tried to express in terms of sovereignty. I think sovereignty was the wrong way to do it, uh, and I think it's an irrecoverable concept for us. We can't seriously, I think, can't seriously, in an adult way, think of God as a king. I mean, it's a metaphor, but it's not, it's not a, I think, a sustainable metaphor uh, for uh, adult human beings. I don't mean for any political reasons, I just mean that we can't really think of, I just think it's a, it's a, it's a, it had its time and it had its place. And so we have to think of it, work out other ways of thinking about the relationship uh, with God and God's relationship to us. Mm -hmm.